in the first 10 or 15 minutes, what I would like to do is I would like to, I would like to answer two questions. Um, the first is, uh, what are the likely conditions that you will experience this summer in the High Sierra generally, and specifically along the Pacific Crest Trail or John Muir Trail, which coincide for a lot of miles through the High Sierra? That's the first question. And then the second question is, what are the implications of these conditions on your trip planning and um, on your uh, gear selection and on your skills? So that's going to be the structure of this presentation. And um, I will not be able to help plan your trip tonight. There, there's too many folks on this call, and there are too many, too many individual um, qualities of your circumstance. So your abilities, your background, your permit, your route. So I won't be able to go into like great specifics on like how exactly to help you. But I do hope that I can share with you some tools, some advice that you can then extrapolate to your own situation in order to go out there better prepared for the conditions that you'll likely find when you go out there. So, okay, so the first thing, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I think it would be more exciting to have some visuals rather than um, to simply be looking at me. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with talking about um, exactly how much snow is in the Sierra right now. And throughout the winter, uh, my favorite resource to check for, to check for um, the snowpack plots or to check for snow conditions, I, it's these interactive plots. And these are available from the, you can here at the header, the California Data Exchange Center, which is the part of the California Department of Water Resources. And this blue line that you're seeing right here, this is indicate, this is showing the, the snow water equivalent over the course of the winter. And it's divided into three different parts of the state, south, central, north. The south would be uh, basically like Sequoia, Kings Canyon and down. And the central is going to be, um, I believe this, I believe the central starts, um, it's either this, it starts with the San Joaquin or it would be the next watershed to the north, which is gonna be the Merced. And then it goes north. Um, and then it probably ends, I'm guessing it probably ends like around I-80, maybe a little bit further south. And then this Northern California, this would be those like more Northern reaches. And this would not be part of the High Sierra. And you can see from these snowpack, snowpack charts that uh, this winter was just, it was truly epic. It was record setting. Um, this is the average snow water equivalent, this blue line here. And this is the this was this year, and this red line. This was the all time the like former historic average. This was the was the huge 82 83 winter. A lot of us weren't backpacking. At least I was I was born in 81, so I have no idea what the conditions were like in 82 83. But there are some more recent years where we can compare the 2022 20, 23 winter to. So some of you might remember the big winters of 2018 2019 or the big winters of 2016, 2017, or the other big winter of 2010, 2011. Um, personally, I was on the trail in, um, it was kind of, it was a pretty wet winter in 2005, 2006. This was my first, 2006 was my first year on the Pacific Crest Trail. So if we go ahead and up, draw that chart, this gives you another sense for how big, this, how big the snowpack was. You can see, especially in the South, the snowpack was just monstrous compared to even years that we thought were big. So um, this just gives you like kind of sets the stage for saying like, wow, there's a lot of snow or a lot of snow fell in the High Sierra this winter. Um, like you can see that just statistically. Um, so the next thing we're gonna go do is um, say like, okay, so we know that there's a ton of snow relative to average in the High Sierra. The other way I think would be better to visualize this, um, we're going to jump into Cal Topo and there's a um, there's a, a great satellite. It's called the Sentinel satellite um, imagery, and this will give you a sense for like exactly how much snow is still sitting in the High Sierra. So I'll search for um, let's go to Tuolumne Meadows. So all of the white here, this is all snow. And this imagery, this satellite imagery was taken on June 5th, so three days ago. And just for some comparison, um, what's nice about this, about the Sentinel satellite imagery is that I'm kind of waiting for this tile to load here. 
um, you can look back at past years. So for example, like we could back, look back, suppose that you did a trip last year in um, say you know, early June of last year. So we can scroll back and look at early June last year. So let's say June, June 9th. And look at how much less snow there was last year relative to this year. Um, and we can look back even further. We can go back all the way to 2017, which was one of those big winters. So I'll go to early June of 2017. And again, a lot of snow still sitting around in early June. And let's go ahead and we'll compare it to the most recent one just for just to kind of get a sense. And like, it's a little difficult to tell because there's a little bit of cloud cover, but it will appear my, my sense is that there's more snow coverage in Ptolemy Meadows area this year than there was in 2017, which was a big winter. So we know that there's a ton of snow up there. And I guess let's go back to this question. So Andrew, so real quick. Yes. Um, could you just give a quick like, what is Caltopo for anyone who's joining who <laughs> sure. doesn't know? So Caltopo is this, it's a fantastic mapping platform. Um, so um, it's my, it's what I use both at home when planning my trips, as well as in the field, because it has a, it has an app, there's a Caltopo app and it syncs up. Um, so uh, in Caltopo, you can, um, in Caltopo, you can go ahead and um, it's like you can have access to like all of the like the scan topos, so like the United States Geological Survey maps, and you can draw lines to um, kind of measure out how where you want to go, and um, you can draw markers, and you can say, hey, I'm going to camp here. This is going to be my first camp right here, and I'm just making this up. I don't think technically you can camp here. Um, so you're not far enough away from Tolly Meadows, according to the Park Service, to camp there, but you can get us um, just kind of give you a sense. The other thing you can do, you can also print maps in Caltopo. So I can um, I can take a take um, a print tile here and print tile here, and then I can export that as a PDF, and then I can send that PDF over to a printing service like FedEx Office or some local printing company like a Minuteman like a Minuteman Press, and they'll print those maps for me. Um, so specifically, I like the 11 by 17 maps with 1 to 24,000 scale, usually 300 DPI. So Caltopo is super powerful mapping platform for both at home and in the field. Any other questions about Caltopo, Hazel? No, but I will say your, uh, your sound quality is a little bit in and out. So like when you're loud, it's great, um, but sometimes it gets quiet. So if you can just Thank you. Uh, Let me maybe see try to say a little louder, that might help. Let me see if I can fix that. But yeah, I can say at least Caltopo uh, and Gaia GPS are kind of two of the most common apps that you'll see beyond, uh, oh God, far out, uh, gut hook, formerly gut hook but far out now, um, both of those. Oh yes, so how do they compare? I would say, I think that Gaia has a slightly better like mobile interface, but Caltopo definitely rocks it with the, uh, the desktop interface and really being able to get a lot of data onto your maps. Um, so especially if you're printing maps, Caltopo is really the way to go. The, the deal breaking feature about Gaia is that you can only print one page at a time. So if you have a route that's longer than say a day or two, um, Caltopo is gonna be far more efficient because you can print multiple pages. Hazel, I'm not sure if um, my audio is any better, but um, I feel like it should be set up to my headset. So I'm not sure what's going on there. So let's, we'll go ahead, um, let's go back to Keltopo. So we've talked about the snow coverage. So let's talk about what the implications will be for all of the snow. So one, one thing that you should expect when you're out there this summer is that you will encounter, you will encounter snow in places that normally you would not. So this was a photo the other day from Thousand Island Lake. And <laughs> there's a lot of snow still sitting up there. I mean, it is still the beginning of June. 
So I would expect there to be snow at Thousand Island Lake at the beginning of June. But if you look carefully, you see very little ground. Like it's still almost 100% snow coverage outside of the, the outlet of the lake. So um, one thing that you should definitely expect in the high Sierra this summer is just a lot of snow in places where you normally wouldn't see it. And I would, I'm sort of anticipating that we won't see, we won't see normal summertime conditions, I'm guessing until the middle of August. And where there's like, where there are long stretches of trail that are melted out. Um, I think prior to that, there's still going to be quite a bit of snow. And um, I would, I'm also thinking that there are going to be a lot of passes this year. So for example, Muir Pass or Forester Pass or um, basically any of the high passes, they are probably not going to melt out 100% this year. So you will have some snow travel almost for sure on sections of the Pacific Crest Trail, the John Muir Trail, and the High Sierra. Okay, just, there's too much snow. The season's too short. The nights kind of stay cool. Um, if not cold, and the daytime highs are never like that warm. So if you're looking at like a you know, 70 degrees, say a daytime high for a couple of weeks in the summer on a north facing slope, it just, it just isn't going to melt out. You're talking about like tens of feet of snow that needs to melt out. Okay, so that's, so that's um, sort of likely condition number one, extensive snow coverage in parts in areas where you normally wouldn't see it. And this is another instance where Caltopo and the Sentinel satellite imagery can be extremely useful. So if we look at, if you're like, hey, I'm planning, uh, my trip is in the middle of August, um, would I expect to encounter, where would I expect to encounter snow around Yosemite? Um, you can go use the Sentinel satellite imagery and your best bet is you can look at 2019, but even better, you look at 2017 because that was a little bit bigger than 2018. And I look at, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna look at like the second week of August. And it looks like we might have some cloud cover that day. Well, let's see if we can't find a better day. Okay, so here's a better day. This, was, this imagery was taken on August 20th, 2017. Um, you can, to kind of orient yourself, you can see, so this is uh, the Lyle Fork, the Lyle Fork of the Tuolumne, and it looks like a pass, or Donahue Pass, because here's Donahue Pass right here. There's like basically no snow still. There's a little bit of snow, August 19th, 2017. So maybe by you know, in, this year, um, maybe mid-August, end of August, there's no snow on Donahue on going over Donahue Pass. But if we look at another pass, so it's like, you know, Muir Pass hold, tends to hold a lot of snow. So let's look at that a little bit more carefully. And you can see that um, still on August 19th, there's still this like long snow field on the other side of Muir Pass. It looks like it's on again, off again snow on the, on the, so on the south approach. And since it snowed more this year than it did in 2017, maybe you want to back that out a little bit if your trip is the middle of August. Maybe you're looking at, looking at imagery from the end of July or beginning of August um, and to get a sense for how much snow coverage you're looking at. And here, like this is actually pretty dramatic. Look at how much snow there still is. So Muir Pass is right here. The red line is the Pacific Crest Trail. And look at how much snow you're still in at the, at the end of July in 2017. So my guess is probably the middle of August, 2017, you're looking at several miles of snow going over your pass. Okay, so again, so we've talked about the snow coverage and how you should just be expecting a lot of lingering snow. Another thing you should be expecting because of all that snow and all that melt, you should be expecting, you should be expecting high water. So um, this is a photo. Let's see if I can. This is a photo of uh, from me in the end of June in 2006 crossing Evolution Creek um, just upstream of the official trail crossing. So this is in through Evolution Meadows, and and it's for me it's like I'm six feet, and it's it looks like it was about navel navel deep, and that was the end of June. Um, so that's a pretty big crossing because I what happened is I went down to the official trail crossing. 
and it was it looked over my head and it was and it was moving swiftly and if you've been there you know that just downstream of that crossing is the giant waterfall that drops down into a larger canyon where the south fork of the san joaquin is uh, so there's just, I felt very uncomfortable crossing there, so I went back upstream and crossed here at the middle. So the second thing you should be expecting when you're out there this summer, you should be expecting high water crossings, and you should also be expecting um, constantly wet feet. Um, another photo that I recently dug up. This is the this is the bridge crossing or the log bridge that crosses Rush Creek. You're going to see things like this too. You're going to see things like this through like into July, probably like the middle of July where like where things are underwater. Um, so a lot of high water crossings um, where you're going to get wet that are going to be swift, they're going to be pushy. Um, and some of them are just going to be like just like frankly unsafe. So that would be condition number two. You've got high water crossings. Condition number three, this is going to be this is going to be um, a, an extensive and delayed bug season. So to give you a sense of bug season in the Sierra, and I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this, um, but this is like evening in the high Sierra. In, this is in Southern Yosemite. And I will point out, this is a guy from Canada. And even he has his rain jacket on because he just, it's kind of becoming a little insufferable. So that's condition number three. You should just be expecting, um, you should be expecting a lot of bugs. Um, and I think that I said that the season will likely be delayed because I think what's going to happen, I think what's going to happen is that it's going to take a long time for the snow to melt. And then it's going to take a long time for the ground to warm up enough that the bugs are actually going to hatch. So whereas normally the bug hatch in the High Sierra is sometime, like say, um, uh, early July, like late June, early July this year, I think it could get pushed mid July, maybe even the end of July. And it's gonna depend on, it's gonna depend on uh, elevation, it'll depend on slope aspect, it'll depend on where the snow is really lingering, but I would expect it to be delayed in the hatch. And then I would expect the bugs just to stick around for the entire summer, basically until the first frost in September. So that would be condition number three. And then the last condition that I think you should be prepared for is you should be expecting extremely dynamic conditions. So you know, in a normal summer in the High Sierra, you've got this beautifully groomed trail, you know, it's known as the Pacific Crest Trail, it's benched and it's snow free and um, the weather is really blissful and the water crossings have all come down from their early season peaks. But for a lot of folks this year who are gonna be out there in June or July, maybe even like through the middle of August, you're gonna be dealing with um, a bunch of variables that are changing every single day. So specifically, the composition of the snow is going to change every day. In the morning, it's going to be firm. By the afternoon, it's going to be at least slushy. And the edges, uh, and there are also going to be places where you post hole. So you just go like through the snowpack, particularly around the edges of snowfields, particularly around the edges of large boulders within the snowfields. So those, those are known as rock moats. Um, so uh, the snow composition is going to change every day. The water levels also change every day. So they tend to be highest in the evening when the waters are, when the creeks are filled with an entire day's worth of, worth of snow melt. And they tend to be lowest in the morning after a night where that snow at least slows down and it's melting. And if the night's cold enough, the snow will actually also kind of like freeze again. And then the other variable too, the bugs are going to be different every single day. Um, they're going to be worse. Than, at their peak in the evening, and they're gonna be their mildest, kind of like the coldest parts of the night and into the morning. And then they'll start coming out during the day once the sun comes out and things warm up. So you're gonna be dealing with those conditions every single day and just this constant, it's more like a game of chess than it is a game of checkers. Um, and then those conditions are changing every day, but they're also changing week to week. So you will read online trip reports about you know, these like huge river crossings in the middle of June, and you get there at the end of June, during a colder spell, and you're like, what, are, what was everyone talking about? These water crossings are no big deal. Or you read an online trip report from some guys who spent like two days at a lake and just got eaten alive by the mosquitoes, and you show up two weeks later and there's not a bug to be seen. So um, those conditions are just constantly, they change throughout the season. 
and you just need to be prepared for those for those uh, for those changes. So. so everyone needs to think about the river crossings. Um, this is the this is the like the single thing that kind of keeps me up at night when I think about guiding trips in the High Sierra. I'm starting in the, for us. We're starting in the third week of July this year. This is the risk that. Um, that I think everyone should be on everyone's radar because it has proven fatal. Um, it's uh, the river crossings are, they're no joke. Even though you're hiking in national parks or popular national forests, these are very, this, these are wilderness areas. The, these crossings, a lot of them are unbridged. Um, no one is upstream. Like these aren't dammed. Um, there's no ranger there giving you advice. So you need to be making your own decisions about these. And so in the post that I just sent, I gave you some suggestions on how to make river crossing safe. And also just remind you too that it's, um, it's okay to turn around. So that's kind of one of the big things. And if I can chime in really quick, I did manage to run into a couple through hikers this past weekend who had uh, just gotten into Bishop and heard from one of them who is a civil engineer that he strongly believes that more bridges will be out by the time all this melts off because um, he was looking at kind of the conditions of the bridges. Was he specifically okay. thinking of like the footers on them or yeah. the, or just he, you could see damage that had been done from just snow sitting on them for months? I think some of them it was yeah that the the um, the footings are getting scoured out. Yeah right I could totally see that yeah. So let me let me give you some resources that you can use to um, to to like improve your trip planning um, and also to help you navigate safely while you're in the field. So let me share my screen again. I also just dropped the link to our page on PCTA.org that discusses the closure and reroute. Yep. So that was going to be a good one. So um, in fact, Hazel, let me actually pull that up. So if you're not familiar with it already, um, the PCTA has a good website on trail closures. And if you're hiking in the High Sierra, you're gonna use the Central California. And it's, it already has flagged the, the three major events that have happened this year. And as Hazel said, this is the current list, but the season is still early. And I bet there are a lot of places in, um, in the parks and the forests that rangers have not got to yet and other hikers haven't got to yet. So there are a lot of through hikers who are on the Pacific Crest Trail or the John Muir Trail, but there are like there are the Pacific Crest Trail and John Muir Trail represent, I don't know, maybe 10% of all trail mileage in the High Sierra. So 90% of the area has not been thoroughly explored yet. 75% of use. Is that what it is really? Is that the number? 75% of use. Oh, okay. I thought you were, I thought that was an actual statistic. It was mostly a joke, but like also <laughs> probably. Yeah. yeah. So the PCTA has a good website. So so stay um stay in touch here. Another good reference, um, there are a couple of like good communities. There's the Pacific Crest Trail group on Reddit. There's also another one that I like is the, is the John Muir Trail group on Facebook. And in both of these groups, you will be finding, um, you'll be finding conditions updates. You'll be finding good conversations. I think these groups have been really supportive of hikers this year and trying to help people prepare properly without a lot of, without kind of too much fear mongering. So these two resources will really help. There's also another great website. It's, it's a little bit more niche, um, but High Sierra Topics. This is a, these guys are like very passionate about the High Sierra and there's a really good uh, forum system. It's a little old school in their structure, but there's very good content. It goes back a long ways. So those are kind of some community resources. And then I've already shown you the Sentinel satellite data, so that would be a, a third resource. So let's jump into um, some water gauges, which will help you figure out water levels. So if you go back to the California uh, Department of Water Resources, they've got this, they have this uh, station locator map. And what you can do is you can jump into here and fly around and you can find 
uh, water gauges, like river gauges. And this one here, this is at Happy Isles. So this is the northern terminus of the John Muir Trail. And the chart that you really want to look at is this, this river discharge in CFS. And it will bring up flow. So this is a, over the past 30 days, this is the flow of the Merced River at Happy Isles. And you'll, what, there are a couple of things that I want to point out. So notice how every single day the river levels change. And this just is related to the freeze thaw of, of um, the freeze thaw related to the temperatures. And, and the, the, the difference is not enormous. So like on the biggest, actually, I take that back. It actually can be enormous. So, so this was June 4th. In the morning, if you had crossed the Merced, the Merced is at 2,900 CFS. By the end of, by, by its peak, it's at 3,900 CFS. So let's just, that is a 30% increase in the flow of the Merced River in, um, in like a, probably a 12 hour period. And if you're taking on a river that's, that's challenging, um, that might make the difference between whether it's practical or not, or whether it's safe or not, whether you have 30% more water in it. Can you talk a little bit about like CFS, like what is like a reasonable rate Ooh. to cross at versus like what is just dead now? That's a great question. Um, I think it's all, it's kind of an, it's almost not a relevant question though, because we don't have the, if you, if you look at the map, they don't have, um, they don't have river gauges on all of the crossings that we would really want. So it's a little difficult to say. And so much too of the safety of a crossing has to do with its width um, and its depth and um, the footing and what's below the crossing. So I don't think there would be like a hard rule. Maybe, it, maybe you could just use some general rules that the further downstream you are, the larger the river is going to get generally the less safe it's going to be. That's probably a, a better, or just a better approach. And let me actually, let me speak to that for a minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of, um, so let me show you, let me see if I can find quickly. Yes, I can. Okay, so the Pacific Crest Trail. So if you've been on the Pacific Crest Trail or the John Muir Trail, you know, like one of the famous crossings is Bear Creek. So this is Selden Pass right here. You climb over Selden Pass and you go past Marie Lakes, and then you drop down. And you cross, importantly, you cross right here the West Fork of Bear Creek. So now you're on the West Fork, and there are two other forks of Bear Creek. There's the South Fork, and there's the East Fork. So you have three forks that come in together. Two of them um, have a confluence right here. And then they all, all three of them are now together right here. And the Pacific Crest Trail crosses downstream of the confluence. So the much safer way to cross Bear Creek is instead of even crossing right here, this is where knowing how to navigate off trail comes in really handy. So you would leave the Pacific Crest Trail at this point and you would walk across here and you would cross the, um, that's the South Fork right here at this like basically the lake outlet. And then you could come down here and you could cross the East Fork and join this other trail. And notice, notice here that this is, um, this looks pretty flat in here. Notice like the, the, the um, distance between two 40 foot contour lines. Whereas you notice as soon as you get off that flat, notice how, how much steeper it is. So uh, this is a much better way to approach this. And I wanna just point out, so Hazel, you might have noticed this too. When I, when I try to create a line here, do you notice how this now is in like the open source? Um, do you see how it turned yellow? That this is now like an open source trail. And I think, I actually wonder if that's exactly what that's for, that hikers are now taking this route because I've been advising it rather than, um, that's interesting. Okay. I wouldn't be terribly surprised. I also do yeah. one word of caution here real quick that uh, I did have brought up to me though is, uh, 
keeping in mind that if you are going a different route uh, to do these crossings, that if there is like a search and rescue incident, that that is going to widen your search area significantly. So just like anytime these types of decisions are being made, like there's always going to be trade-offs, right? Right. In that case, I would still say that you're better off going a little off trail because that crossing in Bear Creek is a nasty one. That's a big, it's a big crossing. Um, here would be another example of like how to safely cross a creek. So the Pacific Crest Trail, and I, I'm gonna, this is the Forest Service layer, which is a little bit more accurate in this area. So the Pacific Crest Trail crosses Rush Creek right here. And you'll notice that, so there's a contour line right here, and there's a contour line right here, a contour line right here. But if you just hike upstream a little bit, you'll notice, look at the gap between contour lines right here. So this would be a much safer crossing. Brush Creek, and it's not far out of your way. I think um, I think this ends up being about a half mile. So you walk 200 or 2,200 feet. So yeah, about a half mile, 600, 681 meters, and you could cross right here, and that would be way safer than crossing up the trail. Um, it might be deep here, um, but it's uh, it would probably be very slow moving if it was deep, um, or it could just be slow moving and very wide, one or the other. Hazel, what do we have for questions? Oh, um, so let me, let me go back to the water crossing. So I was talking about resources. Um, so these, these charts, these um, flow charts are just a great way to figure out kind of like what the water crossings are doing now. Um, if I was going out there right now, I would say like, wow, the water levels are way down versus what they were at the end of May. And it remains to be seen if, if the peak flows were at the end of May, like that might've been the peak for the year. Um, or I, I, my understanding, I think it's been kind of cold and wet, in California, relatively speaking. So like once the, once the thermometer gets turned back up, maybe the, maybe the flows actually then go back up to 5,000 cubic feet a second. Okay, I think I'll stop there. So those are a bunch of resources um, that can help you kind of plan your trip properly.